Want to advertise your business in a cost-effective way? It's time to give podcast advertising a try. Research shows a high rate of podcast listeners made a purchase as a result of an ad they heard on a podcast. Visit podbean.com slash brands to launch a cost-effective podcast advertising campaign in minutes. That's P-O-D-B-E-A-N dot com slash brands. Welcome to Books in the Freezer, a podcast dedicated to the deliciously disturbing world of horror fiction. I'm your host, Stephanie, and today I'm joined once again by my friend Laura for this very special Valentine's Day episode uh, to talk about one of the best couples in fiction in the best-selling novel, Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. So. Yes. A very romantic topic. <laughs> <laughs> I would say aspirational couple status. Oh, yes. I. It's everything I aspire to be this Valentine's Day. I was telling her earlier, I, I did not plan for this to be a Valentine's Day episode, but I say we're just going to run with it. I think it works. It's perfect. So, Laura, what is your history with Gillian Flynn's Gone Girl? Um, well, I remember I saw all three of her novel covers online right around when Gone Girl came out, and I was just like, I have to read this. I especially remember, like, the rope on the cover of Gone Girl, but it also kind of looked like hair, you know, and I was just like, I need to find out what these are about. So, um, I read all of those books, like, fairly, in fairly quick succession, um, Gone Girl was actually, I think, the last of the three that I read. And while I was reading it, of course, I was, like, completely hooked. And I almost canceled plans so I could stay home and finish it. <laughs> and uh, it is a thriller, but I've still reread it, like, numerous times. And I genuinely think it's a well-written book that's not just a cheap thrill for me. Oh, I agree i think i read it the first time in 2014 and i was working at a uh, call center for a security company and i was supposed to be like taking calls and making calls whatever the point is that i was in my cubicle like sneaking my phone and trying to read chapters on my (laughs) kindle app and i remember it got to the midpoint twist and i like physically scooted my little spinny chair back and like put my hands on my head like what (laughs) (laughs) just there having a a little crisis in my cubicle like what did I just read no one was very secure that day I was so mad at incoming calls I'm like I can't reset your system right now Deborah Amy is alive yeah what what do you mean that the security system in your father's house is going off and someone reset the code? I don't know anything about that. I have to read this book. <laughs> You're like, yeah, the system says it's reset. Dummy. Nick, you should know that. All right. Well, I feel like we have so much to talk about with this book. We so really do. I think I'm going to just zip through a quick synopsis just so all of us are on the same page. Um, Obviously, I'm probably going to say this at the top of the episode but this is a spoiler filled episode i obviously spoiled a big thing earlier so <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was i was like oh we're really out here huh we're, we're just spoiling it right now spoilers abound this is a, a novel you can't really interact with outside of really spoiling it and getting into it so All right. So on the morning of their fifth wedding anniversary, Nick goes home to discover his wife is missing. Detectives search their house and grill Nick, but come up with nothing but clues to their anniversary scavenger hunt. 
the public almost immediately wants to blame Nick for Amy's disappearance. Um, when you're reading it, the first part of the novel is told from Nick's perspective, and then we get interspersed sections from Amy's diary. Uh, in Amy's diary, we get chapters showing the idyllic beginnings of their relationship and deterioration once they moved to Missouri to be with Nick's ailing mother. She is worried about where she stands with Nick and is even worried enough to buy a gun. Nick becomes the main suspect as detectives find massive amounts of blood on the floor and mounting credit card debt. The last scavenger hunt clue leads him to the shed where he finds golf clubs, TVs, and puts together what's been going on. Ta-da! Amy is alive. She orchestrated the whole thing to make her husband pay. She's been hiding out in the Ozarks and plans to drown herself when she runs out of money. But she gets robbed, and that foils her plan. She decides to reach out to her creepy, obsessive high school boyfriend, Desi. He takes her home and essentially holds her hostage for a few weeks. Amy sees one of Nick's high-profile interviews begging her to come home and decides that's what she should do. She has sex with Desi, kills him, beats herself up, returns home with a story of abuse and rape. Amy manipulates Nick into accepting her kidnapping story, or she will accuse him of trying to poison her with antifreeze. She did this to herself and kept a vomit sample. They start writing dueling memoirs, but Amy has one more trick up her sleeve. She's pregnant with his baby. He has to play by her rules if he wants to see his child. Feeling guilty about his abusive father, he deletes his manuscript and resigns himself to being the father he should have been all along. Whew. I would say just a touching love story. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. And, you know, in case you are listening to this and you have not read the book, there's a lot of complexity that we can't really get into. And just to recap, but oh, whew, there is a lot going on and it all interacts with itself and each other it is i mean there's characters i didn't mention there's whole side stories i didn't mention there's i would say really getting into the lengths that amy went to frame him and prepare this whole thing yes i can't even get into that i didn't even get into any of and the how things. she made it look yes i can't even get into like the way that she deliberately like used inside jokes and things like that things that other people like specifically would not get because there's no way they would get them because it's something that they literally said out loud to each other <laughs> that's something that i'm guilty of in real life like making references to things that just happened in person <laughs> uh i love that they're like the little brown house yes and even his twin didn't know anyway yeah we didn't even get into his we twin ahead of I didn't get into kind of the relationship with Andy. boney and how like she views yeah. him throughout the novel like there's a ton of stuff i didn't get into it, it makes him feel bad like makes him feel some kind of way and really stresses him out yes which is different in the movie but it's like it's a whole thing anyway that's gone girl <laughs> we'll definitely talk about the movie i rewatched the movie for this episode and i hadn't seen it since it came out i saw it in the theater but i was really pretty impressed with you know they kept a lot obviously gillian flynn was involved and i believe she is a screenwriter like in general not just for this um and you know there are parts of it that were really punched up there are parts of it i'm not an adaptation person so you know i'm always kind of like looking for the purity of the work that i experienced first but you know there are a lot of upsides to it and i think if anybody could make it work it was david fincher which is pretty cool absolutely we'll definitely have to go in depth more about it uh at the end of the episode because there are a ton of things i want to talk about yes uh so i reread the book for this episode and oh man well immediately like you were saying earlier this just is so different from a normal domestic thriller. I wanted to highlight everything. Yes. Just the way Gillian Flynn writes felt like coming home. Yes. Ugh. It's so good. It is so good. And um, I feel like there was a big rash of, you know, this is the next Gone Girl. This is the next Gone Girl. And it's just impossible. It's not fair to those books. Nothing is Gone Girl. <laughs> It's really not. I would say just how layered everything is and every interaction has so many subtextual meanings going on and things you have to read into. It was just, ah, like I couldn't not read it and not give it, I couldn't read it and not give it five stars again. 
Yeah. And I think her writing, I genuinely think she's a literary writer. I love the way that she just phrases things or like the types of topics that she thinks to put in there. And it's not like, it's not single layered. It's not one note. It's like very, you know, uh, in depth, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. If you're listening to this episode, you know, you can hate listen if you want, but you've already downloaded the episode. (laughs) We're going to fan out on, on this thing for the entire time we're recording. Yeah, I know, even I was looking at Goodreads and looking at, you know, mutuals and their one star reviews. And I'm like, (laughs) I just don't agree. Like, I had a lot of threes. Yeah. I'm like, I just, (laughs) you know what, you're entitled to your opinion, but I could debate you on this. Well, I see if people, uh, I saw a lot of three stars. And if it's a response to how hyped the book was i can see that and i'm the kind of person who also was like oh i didn't really think it was that great but like for me like over time this book for me is like an enduring favorite of mine um i actually plug i probably have said this on the podcast before i like dark places a little bit better um (laughs) it's my favorite of the three novels but it's a different book like it's it's just so there is not another book that is like Gone Girl, in my opinion. It's just such a such a couple book, such a marriage book, a society book. <laughs> yeah. Dark Places is the one that has the weakest adaptation, like the worst. Yes, it was bad. And I, who is it? Is it Julianne Moore or is it Amy Adams? It's someone Charlie's I really like Aaron. who plays. Uh, I just I feel bad for them in the movie. It was not very good. It was not skillfully done. If you happen to have seen the adaptation and not read the book, I still really recommend the book. I really like it. Um, and I really like the dark place as it goes. But, you know, yeah. Gone Girl is like its whole thing, in my opinion. Gone Girl, I think, is my number one because it was my first interaction with Gillian Flynn. Um, mm. I also really like Dark Places, but I think Sharp Objects is my second one because you know how I live for messy family stuff. Yes. Yeah, I could see how that would be your favorite. (laughs) I mean, Dark Places also has its own messy family stuff. It's different, though. I think it's more my brand of, like, all these people are horrible. (laughs) Look at all this really gross stuff over here, that type of, you know, dynamic. I think you also have to be ready for that when reading Gillian Flynn's books, because I know a lot of people were reading it and are like, so I just read this book about crappy people. I'm like, yeah, wasn't it fantastic? I love reading stories about awful people. Me too. Like, you're not the target audience if you (laughs) are worried about liking the characters i guess like i understand that motivation for some people but it's just not something that i look for in my reading so i loved it (laughs) um to prepare for this episode i was reading some i guess supplemental materials such as an interview that she did with the guardian and um i pulled out this quote about you know gillian flynn's works and feminism and things like that and um it says it's true of all flynn's novels that her women can be reliably predicted to outdo the men in their capacity for moral depravity flynn identifies herself as a feminist but does she worry that she's damaging that cause in the quest for narrative shocks she says to me that puts a very very small window on what feminism is is it really only girl power and you go girl and empower yourself and be the best that you can be For me, it's also the ability to have women who are bad characters. The one thing that really frustrates me is this idea that women are innately good, innately nurturing. In literature, they can be dismissibly bad, trampy, vampy, bitch types. But there's also still a big pushback against the idea that women can just be pragmatically evil, bad, selfish. I don't write psycho bitches. The psycho bitch is just crazy. She has no motive. And so she's a dismissible person because of her psycho bitchiness. Writing on her website, she concedes that hers is not a particularly flattering portrait of women, but that's fine by me. Isn't it time to acknowledge the ugly side? I've grown quite weary of the spunky heroines, the brave rape victims, the soul-searching fashionistas that stock so many books. I particularly mourn the lack of female villains. And I think Amy Elliott Dunn... Me, not her, uh, talking right now. I think that Amy Elliott Dunn 
like fills a gap in a way that no one else could in that area. She does. I mean, even culturally, I every like I made a TikTok talking about rereading Gone Girl and being in the headspace for this episode. And if you see the barrage of comments that are Amy Elliott fan club, team Amy did nothing wrong. Yes. You know, it is this <laughs> queen. queen status, <laughs> sparkly emoji, girl boss, you know. <laughs> yes. I was so proud. Then I was like, do we just look like psychopaths? Then I was like, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I will say going into rereading this book, I was thinking of like the memories I had mostly from the movie and thinking like, yeah, Nick bad, Amy does cool girl monologue. She's totally fine and vindicated. And reading the book, I was like, oh, she's pretty crazy. I forgot how. Yeah. I forgot the <laughs> depths of like craziness she well i don't know i kind of i look at i look at it different ways because like in the book i actually find it easier to be sympathetic to her because you're so in her head and you see like everything that contributed to this and it's like should you do these things no can i see why you feel some of these things yes (laughs) even though she does worse things so that's the power of it it is and i think even talking about what the issues are, there is, I mean, so many women resonated with it. And there's a reason the Gone Girl, the cool girl monologue has stuck around is because it hits a nerve, I think, in the same way when you listen to a song and hear a lyric that really resonates with you. It's like, this is putting a experience, a frustration I have had and putting it into words with the proper amount of rage behind it. Exactly, exactly. And I think, well, so I read it coming out of college and still kind of in a weird place with fundamentalism. But one of my friends from college had read it, was reading it around the same time, and she screenshotted and sent the cool girl monologue. So I think it's something that just immediately resonates. And I think coming from a place of purity culture especially Mm -hmm. just this idea that you're supposed to be all these things. And, you know, there's no class for men on how there should be good husbands, but everything that is taught to women is on how to serve men, how to be a good wife, how to keep yourself pure, how to do all these things, how to be all these things. And then once you get married, you're suddenly supposed to be this different set of things. And if you're not those different set of things, then when your husband leaves you or cheats on you, you can really only blame yourself. Yes. Yeah, it's just so much pressure. It's so much expectation. And I don't know, it's just the way that she describes it in the book, even though it's coming from this person who's just done this horrible thing, like, it really is, there's so much truth to it. And I think that's why it's endured. I think so, too. So we do have a few <laughs> small thematic <laughs> side steps, uh, a small... Th- Ravings. <laughs> yeah, little section. So I wanted to talk about the relationship with Gone Girl and True Crime. So I one thing that definitely struck me reading it is the similarities between the situation in the book and the Scott and Lacey Peterson case. Even down to the fact that Lacey, when she disappeared, was pregnant and pregnancy or claims of pregnancy are a big thing in the book. And even the fact that um, Lacey was noticed missing because her dog was walking by itself. And it breaks my heart, but that's how Amy uh, reveals herself to have been disappeared is because she lets her precious little infant cat Bleaker outside by himself and he is noticed. So there's a lot of echoes there. I think also the vigil and the press conference that Andy holds, it's, it's all very like, it kind of pings off of each other. And you can see how like true crime from the real world influenced Gone Girl. I was not aware of a lot of the details of the Scott and Lacey Peterson case. I kind of just knew about it as this thing that was going on at the time. But that makes a lot of sense. Those were a lot of parallels I did not know about. Well, it was huge. If you don't know that much about the case, if you read, you know, the Wikipedia article for it or whatever, you're going to be like, whoa, (laughs) 
glasses ripped off because it was so huge. Like, I think I'm slightly older than you, so I maybe was, like, consuming it more at the time. Um, and, I mean, Ellen Abbott is basically a real show. <laughs> and, you know, like, um, pinning Scott to the wall for this without having enough evidence yet. I'm not saying he's innocent. I'm just saying at the time, that's how it was. Um, was a huge thing. And I think that's how Amy got some of her ideas is because she studied these true crime things. And Nick mentions it in the book is that she left these true crime books laying around and it helped her see how are these things going to be perceived? How is the procedure going to go? What can I play into? Yes. So yeah, that's part of Amy's plan is she studies a lot of true crime. And I love that it doesn't raise a single red flag because that is something that has been associated with women is a love of true crime. So it's like, yeah, she's a misery yes. housewife now. She reads these true crime books. That's what she does with her day. You know, he tells Boney when she starts asking him, like, what's your wife into? He's like, I don't know, she reads a lot. <laughs> yes he says it straight out he's like oh you know i thought it was cute that she had this like beach read hobby but it wasn't beach reading it was studying <laughs> yes oh he's so dismissive of her anyway we'll get into that in a bit i know i know <laughs> and amy is i mean a, like a genius and she has a degree yes. in psychology so i think she's just so prepared for how people react and perceive things and knowing how she comes off mm -hmm. to people and her reputation. So that was a huge plus for her. I mean, that she knew that she was going to fall into this perfect victim box. Yes, she knew. She knew because she had been like, somewhat of a public figure her whole life and this idealized you know amazing amy children's books so she could understand how people in the public sphere were going to react to her and she really played into that because she knew that victims are perfect like no one would scrutinize her because they would be afraid to and i see that a lot in true crime Yes, I mean, also the type of cases that garner national attention. Amy is a, yes, like somewhat well-known figure, but she's also a beautiful, wealthy white woman. Exactly. And we still see this even with the, you know, Gabby Petito case, like that took over the yep. whole nation again, and everyone was so consumed with what happened. And it just would not have had, Amy's disappearance would not have had the reach if she was a person of color. No. She could not have gone girl to her husband. <laughs> she used that. She definitely did. And I think that's her strength, whereas it is Nick's weakness. Exactly. And it's part of it's part of what is I don't want to say beautiful. Maybe it is beautiful. <laughs> the way that it's not just her. It's not just him. It's not just their relationship. It's like the way that they echo off of each other. And he can't handle the fact that he looks this way. He looks unlikable. He looks, you know, bad because there are a lot of things about him that are bad <laughs> and he just can't handle it. Yes. And he has he takes no responsibility. In Nick's chapters, he's just constantly bemoaning that he can't help that he comes off a certain way or that he has a punchable face and he doesn't take any responsibility for the way he is or the actions he does. Um, he, I mean, Boney immediately makes the, like, ask the question, like, oh, were you the baby of the family? Like, you have no initiative. You didn't call anyone. Like, she kind of is suspicious of him, but also kind of is like, oh, I see, like, the kind of person you are. Yes. <laughs> I kind of love that. That she's, like, so, you know, she kind of has his number in a certain way. Yeah. And I mean, going along with the true crime is the relationship to the media and the court of public opinion, I would say. Yes. Goes hand in hand with that. Yes. I think that the melodrama of cable news and the 24-hour news cycle, which was a newer thing during the Scott and Lacey Peterson case, um, is key to the tension. 
And it allows Amy to watch everything unfold and even interact with the case because she knows what clues have not come out yet and she can call the tip line and actually uh, give clues framing Nick further if needed. I just think it's really brilliant the way that she set it up. Yes. And she also knows how Nick is and that at the vigil, he's going to act dumb and immediately be labeled as the one that did it one because there's always the like the husband did it narrative that Mm -hmm. is so you know just part of true crime and like missing women unfortunately but because of that that he's going to be the number one suspect and that the way he acts and how like cagey he is that he is going to fit right into that mold Yes, she's extremely aware. She knows him better than anyone. And I feel like she knew things like that woman who was kind of flirting with him. And the fact that there was a picture of him with her, like she couldn't have set that up, but it was something that she knew something similar to that was going to happen. That he could not. And a lot of the things that, yes. And a lot of the things that happen or the details are things that she didn't need for them to work but she's like this is a bonus you know and it's like a reward for her to get to watch it all that's why she doesn't kill herself right away or doesn't plan to yeah and the way that he does get amy to come back is by being charming in the big interview and speaking you know to the camera to her and speaking, you know, with their inside jokes and their, you know, chin thing and speaking to her yeah. and telling her the things she wants to hear. Yes. And then he has, you know, this amazing lawyer helping him learn how to, you know, speak that way and be most effective. I think that that helped him also oh, yes. so that she actually was won over by it. Which is funny, though, because I will say that is a hypocritical thing for Amy, because yes. <laughs> when she's writing the scavenger hunt clues, and we don't see this as much in the movie, but as he's reading the scavenger hunt clues, he starts to kind of fall back in love with Amy a little bit yes. as she's stroking his ego and calling him like witty and brilliant and calling out all these memories that they had. And in her sections, she's like, what an idiot. Obviously, I knew what I needed to say. <laughs> he probably started falling back in love with me. What a dumb dumb. But then he does the same thing to her and she flips it as like, yeah, because you love me. You know exactly what to say. <laughs> we're meant to be. Like, she doesn't see it as like, yeah, you also were fell prey to hearing the person you love tell you what you want to hear. Exactly. It's just so, it's so well put together. And it's not something that should be in a relationship. I think what is amazing about it is that it's such a uniquely over-the-top toxic relationship that the toxicity of their relationship is beyond any extraordinary thing about them as individuals. It's just so uniquely fitted to one another. Yes. And I mean, we'll get into this more when we talk about the movie, but in the book... It is much more about the toxic relationship on both sides. Yes. Another big theme in the book, I would say, is misogyny and gender roles. Yeah, definitely. So in Jude Doyle's book, Dead Blondes and Bad Mothers, Monstrosity, Patriarchy, and the Fear of Female Power, which I love, um, the book. Also, I mean, the fear of female power. Gone Girl sold by the truckload, in part because Flynn did not try to sanitize the brutality of Amy's resentment. Gone Girl gave a way for women to vent their daily indignities and unspeakable anger safely and without consequence. Let us have our wedding cake and poison it too. It was an opportunity to save the wife and punish the husband for killing her at the same time. Which we kind of talked about a bit earlier. Well, a little bit, but, you know, I think it's worth pulling it out and talking about why you know we resonate with Amy so much and why um it really says some true things about gender roles in our society I think so too uh a lot of things are brought on really early on just through Nick's uh 
Jude has another thing they wrote here. They say, at the points where autonomy and personhood bump up against the edges of wifeliness, monsters arise. But these monsters are only a reflection of a deeper powerlessness, impractical revenge fantasies against a system too huge and old and powerful for even the most monstrous woman to defeat. I had not read this book, but I was preparing some of my thoughts about this. And I I wrote some things that were a bit similar, but not as well said (laughs) that were like, this is a safe way to take things that you're really frustrated about and just bring them up and work them through in fiction. It doesn't mean that you condone real actions. It means that reading about this can give you just a sense of clarity or being seen or, you know, it's just a way to play with the topic. And I think that it's very brilliantly done in Gone Girl. I think so too. I think, yeah, just really naming the frustration. But with the like wife getting lost in marriage in the first chapter nick right away writes off the fact that amy also lost her job in new york yeah yes he it's like i don't know it's just not as big a deal to him and one of the narrative things that is interesting that i love about gone girl too is that nick is fully in charge of the narrative for the first half of the book and he still turns the reader against him he still like you know as in his real life is not aware of the way that he comes off and he alienates the reader out of his side yes isn't that incredible like you're hearing his side and you're still like god (laughs) this guy is a jerk i can't stand him (laughs) truly well just uh the way he writes about it he's like i lost my job and he's like and then he makes an aside like this is where amy would roll her eyes and say she also lost her job because that's the kind of thing amy would do yes it's like well it's true nick you know (laughs) why is she the bad person for having both had the same job exactly they were both writers they both wrote for magazines they both wrote you know pretty fluffy material And why is she the bad person for having feelings about what happened, not you the bad person for dismissing it? (laughs) It just makes her the bad guy regardless of anything. He's just so, I don't know, he's very resentful of the fact that she exists as a person with thoughts and feelings, (laughs) etc. This episode is brought to you by Libro FM. Libro FM is the first and only company which lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. You can pick from more than 150,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there. You know the name. But you'll be part of a different story, one that supports community. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. Listen during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro FM app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best. Booksellers. I mean, and us. We also have a playlist on there full of books that have been recommended on this podcast. Books in the Freezer special offer, you get two audiobooks for the price of one, just $14.99, with your first month of membership using code FREEZERBOOK. This offer is valid for new members in Canada and the United States. Thank you, Libro FM, for supporting the show. Another thing is that he also just assumed Amy would move to Missouri because his mother was ill. It wasn't a discussion. No. I think he even commits to it over the phone with his sister without talking to her. He's just like, we are going to Missouri. Yeah, I am taking you, Amy, away from the only place you've really ever known, from your family, from your support system, and moving you to the middle of Missouri. And from the potential to get another job similar to what she had, all of those would have been in New York, but he just basically yanks her out of the entire writing world as well, and he does not acknowledge that at all. (gasps) You're right. Another thing that is more that is clearer in the book is Nick's issues with misogyny that stem from his father. Yes. It's hinted at in the movie, but it is an overarching theme in the novel. 
that we get throughout. Yes. It's extreme. It's, I think it's really integral to his character and I will get into it later, but I think that in the movie, he just comes off more likable because some of these really icky, insidious things don't really come across. And there's the quote, this is later in the novel, but it's like, she was not the thing she became the thing I feared most an angry woman. I was not good with angry women. They brought something out in me that is unsavory. I mean, women in general, honestly, with Nick, I remember like at one point after he's been interrogated all this time, he goes back to his sister's house and he's like, I went there not because I had to, but because I just wanted a woman to make me a sandwich and not hassle me. And I knew she would do that. And I'm just like, oh, (laughs) come on. This is your own sister, man. (laughs) Who he respects, who he kind of treats as like, oh, she's not really like other girls. But at the end of the day she is just a woman to him yeah oh that gave me a chill it's like (laughs) it's like she's almost like his best friend she basically is but still at the end of the day she's superseded by what biological sex she is to him even Margot's not free from the cool girl narrative I mean, even with the cops, this has also changed in the movie, the dynamic with Boney and um, her partner, like in the movie, it's a much younger guy and she has more seniority. Um, Yeah, although I thought that was cool because she was more in charge. It's just different. It is different because in the book, like the other guy, I wanted to slap him. He says, you're an old fashioned guy. I'm the same way. I tell my wife all the time, I don't know how to iron. I don't know how to do the dishes. I can't cook. So sweetheart, I'll catch the bad guys. That I can do. You throw some clothes in the washer now and then. Rhonda, you were married. Did you do the domestic stuff at home? Boney looked believably annoyed. I catch bad guys too, idiot. Yeah, it's just so, it's like so in your face. Like, uh, we we do the exact same job, FYI. <laughs> uh, and then at the, from the end of the cool girl monologue, we have Amy saying, I waited patiently for years. For the pendulum to swing the other way. For men to start reading Jane Austen. Learn how to knit. Pretend to love cosmos. Organize scrapbook parties. And make out with each other while we leer. And then we'd say, yeah, he's a cool guy. It's unfathomable, isn't it? Like, you would think logically that would be something that would eventually happen. But really, like, there have been trends here and there. But they're very much outliers. It's just not something that is an expectation. I think that in a certain sense, it's not equal, but Nick actually is pretending to be a more charming guy than he truly is when they meet, but it's not really the same thing because it's just a status quo. Men expect to keep the cool girl, whereas women know that men won't put in the type of effort that Nick was putting in forever. Nick just finds a new cool girl when he meets Andy. He's putting on an act with her, too. In the book, at least, he comes to a point where he's like, you know what? I never really was in love with her. And he just shrugs her off as though it was nothing. And he's been in this, like, whirlwind romance with her the whole time. It's just about being a charming guy. And it's not who he really is. Yeah, no. And he, yeah. He just needs his ego stroked. And I mean, Margot, you know, tells him after she yells at him for just like, you are literally being investigated for your wife's disappearance and you bring your like teenage mistress over here. Like, what is your problem? And he's like, she's 22. Yeah. (laughs) But uh, yeah, he tries to do the thing where he's like, she's a very special person and I really am in love with her. And we saw how long that lasted until it's inconvenient for him. Yeah, which Margot points out. Which is really what she's like, you know what? She's, you stay with her. Guess what? She's going to have needs. She's going to ask things of you that you're not going to like. She's going to stop being this like pretty little thing to you. That has haunted me. Like, the the phrasing of that has haunted me. Like, eventually, she's going to ask you to do something. And it's like, wow. (laughs) That really is kind of something that he was never prepared for and didn't want in his life. Especially, Nick has so much reverence for his mother, who is very, like, sweet in a Midwestern way, very classically nurturing and loving. And she kind of, uh, after she divorces Nick's father, is very much this, like, selfless single mom, you know, working at a shoe store and, like, doing everything to take care of her kids. Um, 
which makes it interesting that he goes especially for especially Nick. Yeah, she babies Nick, and which makes it interesting to see that he goes for a woman like Amy, who is not really those things at all. Yeah, I mean, she even the part she was playing as cool girl was just so different. But um, I don't know. He he finds his mother so sainted, but that's his mother. That's not someone he actually wants to be in a relationship with. It's someone he wants to essentially take from because she is giving all the nurturing to him and then pretty much every other woman in his life is not on that level with him yeah which amy points out she's like you could never be happy with someone like yes they would never push you to be the person (laughs) that you are when you're with me oh their toxicness is fantastic i it's just amazing (laughs) i really love the way it's written it just you know, it's just something you don't see in every book. Uh, yeah. I think Amy is so fascinated, and especially considering the fact that she is kind of haunted by this amazing Amy character that her parents yes. have created, which is so messed up. Yes. Oh, my God. I feel like we could almost do, or I could almost do, like, a whole other podcast just about her relationship with her parents, because it is very complicated deep and painful and the way that they let's just say it's a little dramatic of a word but they exploit her and her childhood by writing these books about what she should have done because amazing amy the book is always about something that maybe amy didn't do but they make amazing amy do it the way they would have preferred and it's just so hurtful and they don't see that at all they are just you know they see it as their thing to use another really stressful part of that for amy is that her parents actually struggled with infertility and had multiple stillborn babies and miscarriages which is so sad and she was the only child who survived so she's not only an only child but she is very distinct from these losses who they all named hope Mm -hmm. and the mom uh mary beth is always you know kind of commemorating the days that she lost those children and that's you know such a difficult thing for her to go through i don't want to minimize that But part of a consequence of that is just that Amy feels so much pressure. Like, she is the only chance. She is the only one. They specifically gave her a name that was just a common name, not, like, symbolic, like these hopes. And it's just one more thing that she can't live up to because you can't live up. It's kind of like the victimhood thing in true crime. You can't live up to someone who is no longer there and people no longer feel like it's fair to scrutinize them or there is nothing to be scrutinized. She is just the only chance for greatness with them. And it's just very complicated. That is very complicated. I really, I think that it's something that kind of, you know, as a reader, maybe you psychologically respond to it because I always have a soft spot for Rand and I'm very close with my dad. I feel like it's a thing where, you know, Rand is trying so hard to like be involved or like do things right. And um, I don't, did you respond to it in a different way? Like from your own experiences? Um... You don't have to answer it if that's like <laughs> if I'm like throwing something at you. Just something that came to me. <laughs> I mean, I think from the idea that like my mother is an immigrant and I'm like the firstborn child, so it is very much like I have to achieve and you are pushed to oh, this like yeah. higher like what is this A minus? This A minus isn't good enough. We get A's. Are you the oldest also? Yeah. I am too. I think there's something like it's not the same as being an only child, but I think there's something that comes to oldest daughters, especially. Yeah, there's a whole thing with that. Ugh. And I mean, another thing with the Amazing Amy books is that there are these different situations and these different characters get introduced and Amy always knows the exact way to act that in all these situations, 
you know, there's, do you do A, this, B, you know, this thing, C, this thing, and there is a correct answer. Yes, and real life isn't like that. Even if they did mine these situations from real life, they aren't including everything in the books that may have contributed to Mm -hmm. the situation. And I don't know, I just feel like it would be so hard to live up to literally books that your parents are writing (laughs) about this amazing child. It's just something that I can see how it messed her up, to be honest with you. Absolutely. And I mean, also, I mean, she's a little, we get hints of her being possibly psychopathic from this early age where she talks about like, punishing her mother and when they interview other people this need for justice and i mean possibly these books contributed to that very binary thinking like if you do bad things you must be punished yes exactly like in a book things go a specific way and even in gone girl things go you know a specific way that is satisfying for a reader or that isn't necessarily like real life but In Amy's case, she had to live with this being applied to her own life. It just, I just can't imagine going through that. It's so, you know, really hurtful because it critiqued her decisions like quitting a team or to play an instrument or not and things like that. And then, of course, uh, later on when they had amazing Amy get married and Amy Elliot was not yet married, that's pretty, pretty hardcore. And I think also the idea that she's named Amy, like they didn't even change the character's name. Yes. <laughs> That's so funny. I didn't think about that. They couldn't even make it like, you know, this is a proxy, but clearly it is you. No, it's you. We gave her your name. <laughs> make no mistake. And I get so mad when I get to the part where they take her trust fund money. Yes. I mean... I don't know. It makes me sad at the same time because they, I don't know, they just needed it so badly. And you can tell at the end of the conversation when Mary Beth, I think, wants it wired instead of her writing a check because she doesn't have time for the check to clear. It's like this was really their last resort. But I think that Nick doesn't acknowledge what she went through with that with either the trust fund like he just sees her as you know unilaterally privileged for having Mm -hmm. access to this money of her parents and the loss of it and how she used the very very last of it that must have been so stressful for her with no job and no prospects moving back to missouri to you know get them set up in missouri but they had to ask for so much money back from her because they had mismanaged it. It was just so, I guess, desperate, sad, infuriating, like all at the same time. So Amy has the shadow of amazing Amy and Nick has the misogyny from his father. Yes, they are both haunted people and hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. He has the, early on in the book, he says, I, uh, talking about Amy getting him the bar, Um, I swore I would pay her back with interest. I would not be a man who borrowed from his wife. I could feel my dad twisting his lips at the very idea. Well, there are all kinds of men, his most damning phrase. The second half left unsaid, and you are the wrong kind. Exactly. Another part after dealing with the investigation he says no matter how hard i try to be my mother's son my dad's voice comes into my head unbidden depositing awful thoughts nasty words sir this is a crime scene you stupid bitch yes i think that something that was really smart of gillian flynn was making the father you know like essentially mentally impaired he has dementia or alzheimer's and that removes all of his filters. So he really is like going around, like calling women bitches all the time and trying to run away from the nursing home. And, you know, all of that is right on the surface. It's not something you have to read into. And Nick lives with that all the time. I mean, very, you know, up close and personal even because he moved to be near his mom and now his dad is right there. 
And as we later find out, uh, Amy tries to kind of lure his dad. So because she knows that it will destroy Nick if she, you know, comes up and is like, I love you. You can come be with us anytime. Just, you know, come to our house, blah, blah, blah. And he does. He keeps escaping the nursing home and showing up at their house. And Nick doesn't understand why, but Amy sets some of that up. It's just because his father was, you know, so susceptible to it that she can get away with it. Speaking of Amy's planning, uh, that is one thing in this story, in the movie and the book, where I'm just like, chef's kiss, Amy. You really thought of everything. Yes, I am so in awe. Do I agree with it? No. But... I am so in awe of everything that she thought of. It's down to a level of detail we could never cover in this podcast. Yes, I mean, to creating a friendship with the busybody neighbor that she knew Nick would never ask her about, that, you know, he she knew he had no interest in what she did in her day-to-day life, which allowed her to kind of have this whole life when he wasn't there that would make him look so bad when she went missing yes yes just (laughs) it's really incredible it's it's just so so detailed so intricate and so it's something you wouldn't just immediately start doing and you know have like i don't know one destination in mind it all kind of pings off of everything else I am a Scorpio sun and a Virgo rising, and I would be honored if Amy had any of the same placements as I do. Like, oh, this is a masterpiece of really horrible behavior. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about the movie a bit. Okay. So you watched it, rewatched it recently. I did, yes. And I was so, I don't know. I had just reread the book. I think I finished it the same day. So it was like so... Um, such a contrast in my mind and I could see the way that it related with the book so much more clearly. Yeah. I, I also rewatched it recently. I like them both, but I think there's each one has its own strengths. Yes. Um, I agree. But oh, in the movie, I think the moment when Nick goes to the shed and he like, opens up the door and the music is crescendoing as he's like looking and seeing the final clue there in front of him and the mountains of stuff that she bought with the credit cards and it is all hitting him like that moment is perfection yes like we're kind of and then it cuts to an alive amy yes because in the book it's kind of like i headed to the shed end of chapter yes then amy but i think like really it's a better moment to like let it play out a few minutes more yeah and to just just see it happening and it's so sinister in the movie you can't really there's something about a soundtrack that you just don't quite get in a book Uh, trent reznor this is the gone girl soundtrack is on my reading playlist it's good it's just (laughs) tense (laughs) that's perfect uh so we talked earlier the screenplay was written by gillian flynn um and i think it does work pretty well i think the use of voiceover is very important i think when you see a lot of authors Mm -hmm. when they adapt their own work they use a lot of voiceover because it's like i know it should be dialogue but there's just so much stuff that like needs to be in there (laughs) yeah it's just a you know a strength of one medium versus the other you kind of have to hear some of the characters thoughts Mm -hmm. And it's directed by David Fincher, so it is a darkly beautiful movie. Yes. It has, you know, some shades of Zodiac, I feel, but that's, you know, the closest I would call it to anything. Mm -hmm. I do like the casting. Um, You know, Reese Witherspoon does a lot of adaptation, like, projects for, like, books she likes, and this was one that she championed. Mm -hmm. She's a producer on this, and I think originally she wanted to be Amy, but uh, I think Rosamund Pike was the right choice. Yes, I think Rosamund Pike, she kind of has the look for it, and I think that there's something about uh, Reese Witherspoon where we kind of associate her with these more 
likable fun characters much warmer people i would say like l woods <laughs> yes i would have a hard time divorcing her from that and really seeing her as this cold person i think she could do it but i think unfortunately our image of her is just too too much to separate her from that yeah i think she could have she could have a very sinister role in the future i just think this one maybe was not the one for her i do think that ben affleck is like it could have been no one else but Ben Affleck. He's perfect for Nick. I think so too. I mean, down to the way he's described in the book as like being this Irish boy and having this like punchable face, <laughs> and he's like, ah, people just don't like me. But you know, like I'm an attractive guy, and I have this kind of like smarmy way about me smile. Like everything about him is like, this is this is Nick Dunn you picture Ben Affleck when you're reading the book. I feel like I maybe did before the movie even came out. I don't remember 100%. Either that or I heard the casting and I was like, oh man, that <laughs> that is perfect. Yeah, I think I remember when I heard it's the casting. Just, I was like, yeah, could be no one else, honestly. Yeah. Um, perfect. I just, I have a theory that Ben destroying his personal life has just kind of been this extended uh, Nick Dunn method performance. <laughs> I think he gets I love he gets these cryptic texts from David Fincher and he just has to do what they say. Like I want to believe he just like wakes up and gets a text and he's like a phoenix tattoo on my back. It's like, <laughs> you want me to say what about All Jennifer right. Garner? And he's like you are Nick Dunn, you must. <laughs> Maybe he made like a deal or something like a monkey's paw type of thing. And he's like, I have to do this now. He just doesn't have a choice. He shook David Fincher's hand and he's like, you will become Nick Dunn. And he just didn't understand <laughs> fully the implications yeah. of that. Yeah. Now he's like, oh, my God, my life is falling apart. I used to be Ben Affleck. <laughs> that used to be a good thing. Yeah. Now people are like, Ugh, Ben Affleck. Is he a little bit relatable <laughs> looking exasperated with his Duncan? <laughs> Oh, man. Oh. It is kind of a love to hate, though, you know? Like, it's like, okay, I this is a known quantity. I understand that I hate it. It is obnoxious. But <laughs> there's, like, that level of perfection there that Nick Dunn espouses. Yeah. Uh, there was a few changes made that I kind of like more in the movie. I think one of the differences I like is in Amy's plan, um, getting the blood on the kitchen floor in the book she like slices her arm and like just lets it bleed all over the floor and then you know when she's driving away has to be careful with the incision whereas in the movie she just has like an a little iv in her arm and she's just calmly sitting there like reading a book and like getting weaker and just like oh it's just so much more well thought out it's so calm and so sinister yes i totally agree and i wondered if gillian flynn maybe didn't think of that until she was doing the screenplay because it really is much more amy to do something so like calculated and less you know i want to say desperate mm -hmm. for her to be just you know gouging herself and i think she was biting on a rag like that's just not that's not Amy. I think the needle is way more, you know, it's the perfect thing for that scene in the book. Yes. Um, oh, also, Amy's killing of Desi. Yes. It's what I think of when I see Neil Patrick Harris. It's really... Because <laughs> in the book, she sleeps with him and then gives him, like, sleeping pills. Yeah, it's very, it's almost like, I think it is an off-screen death. Yeah. And in the movie, for those who haven't watched it, uh, she slices his throat mid-coitus. And, like, like yeah. he's on top, like, the blood is just, like, splurting on all over her. It's a scene. I mean, in the book, she does have sex with him because that's part of the plan. Yes. But it's just not, you know, this really brutal kill scene. Um, I think that there are some complexities to Desi's character that we don't really have time to get into that they didn't really yeah. fully go into in the movie because in the movie he does come off like he's purely a victim 
Whereas I'm not saying he's not a victim, but in the book, you know, he definitely has certain expectations of Amy and certain, there are things about him that are, you know, um, just more complicated. In the book, yeah, we do get into that the su- the attempted suicide was not real. Amy completely made that up. Yes. Um, where yes. in the movie, that's never said. Like, you just assume that he did, and he just doesn't want to talk about it. Um, in the movie, like, he does get a little bit like, oh, you're going to look a certain way. You are going to do this. Like, this yeah. is the expectation I have of you and the image I've created in my mind and how Amy plays into that to, like, win his trust. Oh, and how she how she does everything for the cameras. I'm just that was another thing. I'm like, yeah, that was awesome. Damn girl. Okay, there are cameras all over Desi's. um, I don't know estate, his um, extra house that he's keeping her in. And I think in the movie they make it a little more clear. Like, no, she cannot just leave. No, she cannot just try other things. Like, let's ramp this up. It makes him more, you know, sinister that he's like more literally keeping her prisoner. But it does lose a little bit of the, you know, kind of, he just has this very idealized relationship with Amy in his own mind. And he's a different type of Desi from the one that Neil Patrick Harris plays. And I think that it's a type of relationship that a lot of people maybe have experienced where, you know, he gets off on being being there for her and her being in this, like, weakened state or being this victim because she told him for so long that her father was molesting her that's why he hates her father so much it's it's really brilliant we can't really get into it but it's very different oh, that's another thing like in the book reading about her interactions with these people i'm like oh she was crazy she yes was. it's like it's so detailed though and so i mean she didn't want She knew what she was doing when she was like, oh, you know, this is how my father is, blah, blah, blah. And it makes Desi seem more like he could have done something to Amy. It makes him seem shadier because he doesn't like Rands and he, you know, is very, I don't want to say aggressive, but, you know, he is openly disdainful of him. But there's a reason for that, and that's because Amy told all these lies about him. (laughs) But, you know, it's something that Desi kind of, he was attracted to, honestly, that Amy was a victim and was, Yeah, he got to be. Yes. Uh, In the only way he could. Oh, my. In the movie, when I saw it in theaters, that her killing him really was, like, the shock of all shocks. Because, like we said, that's not how it goes down in the book. Um, oh my gosh. Well, especially also, since we had read it, we're like... <laughs> yeah. Um, also, when she was get, looking at herself in the mirror and getting the bottle, I'm like, uh-oh, I know what she's going to do with that. Yikes. <laughs> yep. You watch that whole thing. I think in the book, she just kind of describes, I did this, I'm going to do this, you know? But when you're watching her, you're kind of looking her in the eye through the mirror and seeing, you know, I am going through this right now. You're like, ooh. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember the being in the theater and her taking the bottle and thinking, oh, they're going to, are they going to show this right now? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, another, I would say kind of the big difference between the movie And the book is that it lightens up Nick's character a bit, where I think at the end of the movie, you're supposed to feel sorry for him, like he's trapped with Amy and like he's helpless and there was nothing he could do. Okay, this is the thing about the movie that is kind of a sticking point with me. And it's why I don't, I guess, love it as much as maybe it deserved. And I really think that if someone has only seen the movie, the book deserves to be read because... I think that in order to be a movie, they had to put someone forward as more of a hero. Not perfect, but more of the hero and more likable. And they left out so much, you know, negative about Nick. He doesn't come off as good, but, you know, they left, they made it seem like Nick was, you know, a good guy or a neutral guy or a relatable guy deep down, but he was just under pressure or he was just making bad choices. And there's stuff like really scummy stuff in the book about going to strip clubs and getting numbers on their anniversary and 
In the movie, they lease the house, which implies that he's paying for it. Whereas in the book, I believe Amy buys it with like the last of her trust. Yeah. I thought they were and renting. Maybe I'm confusing the book and the in movie the book, too. I might, I might be wrong also. I just stood out to me. I was like, is that what happened? I thought Amy bought it. But um, the treasure hunts thing is also different to me in a way that I just can't quite get on board with. Like, Nick is not as terrible at the at the treasure hunts. And it's not... You don't see him whining about how he couldn't get the clues right in the same way where, you know, he's complaining that, you know, as though she's doing this horrible thing for wanting him to listen to her. There's just so much about Nick that does suck. Like, beyond... I think that the fact that he's having an affair in the movie is kind of played for laughs and it's kind of, you know, like, oh, what are you going to do type of thing? Boys will be boys or maybe not that specifically, but he seems more relatable and he doesn't seem quite as scummy of a person. And that, you know, it bothers me. I think it's not as strong as if they are both horrible people. Yeah, his massage, like... It's hinted at a bit, but it is not how it is in the book. It is not this overarching theme and thing that he's struggling with. Um, Like in the book, when Amy tells him that she's pregnant, he really only decides to stay when he finds out the baby is a boy. Whereas in the movie, her just kind of saying that she's pregnant is like when he stops. And it's like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, like this is what I have to do. I mean, that's a small thing. In the book, we do get more of Nick's inner monologue. Um, like, in the book, he, part of his inner, he says, you know, come back, Amy, so I can kill you. And in the movie, he's in the back of the car, and he says, come back, Amy, I dare you. Which just, you know, is not yeah. the same. And It's not the same, and I, I think they had to simplify it and the way that the story is told it kind of you know it's through an audience proxy which is nick you know discovering these things which i think is just different it's a different way of storytelling that you know makes him come across as more relatable by by the style of it i think so too but oh man at the end when he's like breaking the news to margo that he's gonna stay with amy And she says, oh, you want to stay with her. But there's nothing really else in the movie that suggests that. Whereas in the movie, it's like, you see, oh, no, he wants to stay with her. He wants to kind of give this another chance and be like the man that he is with Amy to this baby. Yes, it's very specific, in my opinion, in the book that like, you know, she says things like you couldn't be happy with someone like your mom. You couldn't be happy with someone like that lady who brought you the Frito pie. Like you can only be your best self with me. And it's true. Like there really is something about them as a couple. It's not just Amy as this villain. Like it really is. They both have their own toxicity. And I wish it could fully come across. I think that there's some, you know, things about society in general that just don't make it look the same on a screen and i tried to work through my thoughts with that more i think there's some like misogynistic self-talk that makes it harder to see someone do the things that amy is doing and feel like i relate to these things as opposed to you know like reading it and hearing what she's saying more yeah Um, i mean amy is it's just definitely not a feminist (laughs) no (laughs) she's uh more of a a narcissist yes but you know it's just something that i think is harder to fully come across on a screen and they i think that the movie gives it the best shot it could have but it's maybe a medium thing yeah i mean it still is such a good movie but i would say that is kind of my issue with it too is that reading of it but still so good one thing I wanted to do that I think is funny is read some letterbox reviews of Gone Girl because it is just... <laughs> this should be good so here's some of my favorites whenever I think about getting back together with my ex I watch this film works like a charm every time 
Now, was that a male or a female reviewer? Male. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> See? When I gone girl my husband, I'm not leaving the cat behind. Exactly. That is me. Me in real life. <laughs> uh, poor Bleaker. Could use some more of Ben Affleck saying, my wife, in a Borat voice. But <laughs> other than that, it's pretty good. <laughs> I would agree with that. Me, whenever I'm in public alone and a man walks near me, this man may kill me. (laughs) (laughs) This bitch really went, I feel myself fading when caught in a huge ass lie. Imagine being that much of a Virgo. (laughs) (laughs) She has to have some Virgo placements. She's either a Libra or Scorpio sun, which I figured out from her birthday in the book. Sorry to go into this stuff. Go ahead. But... I think she's a Scorpio. As a Scorpio, I think she's a Scorpio, but I think she definitely has some Virgo placements, maybe Mercury, Mars type of situation. I could see it. Oh, here's one. Nick Dunn. (laughs) I did not hit her. It's not true. It is bullshit. I did not hit her. I did not. Oh, hi, Margo. (laughs) What a story, Nick. (laughs) I'm sorry. The old Amy can't come to the phone right now. Why? Because she's dead. (laughs) Of course, we do have the like, she's right. And she should be allowed to do that. So again, love Letterboxd reviews. Yes. Just a a great survey of the reactions to this film. All right. Well, closing out this discussion, because I feel like we could honestly go longer. But. Oh, dude, I could. (laughs) I I could go on so long about Amy's social struggles and childhood and just everything she went oh through. But we have to, you know, this is a love letter to Gone Girl on Valentine's Day. And we have to eventually close the letter yeah. and send it. We are. We are licking the stamp and putting it on. <laughs> so, Laura, as we are ending this episode with the books on the freezer tradition, what is your final girl song? You know, I think about my final girl song whenever I'm nowhere near recording an episode, but I think for a Gone Girl episode, uh, I think that it's very fitting to go with Applause by Lady Gaga. I think that you can really picture Amy doing some of what she's doing for the applause. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially, oh, when she is like, eating and watching all of her coverage about her. Exactly. Like, I, I heard the song. That's exactly what I pictured in my head. I'm like, oh, my God, this is this is my final girl song. Oh, and she gets so mad at the girl that's at the Ozarks with her <laughs> because she does not yes, like Yes, I Amy. love that. She spits in her mountain. And <laughs> like, I think that Amy never considered that. I think that she thought that because she'd only heard this reaction to the books that was so positive, like she, it never occurred to her that people might find them obnoxious. But anyway, yeah, we could honestly go on a whole nother tangent. So we won't. <laughs> She is there for the applause. All right, Laura. And what is something you have been enjoying in horror lately? A chilling obsession of sorts. Okay, well, you know, Gone Girl is maybe horror by a loose definition in that it is a thriller. Um, I'm going to go with something that is also horror by a looser definition. And that is an account called VC Andrews Life on TikTok. Um, she does uh, what it says, TikToks about V.C. Andrews, specifically the books that were actually written by V.C. Andrews, not her ghostwriter. And I just think it's amazing. I love that she uses the TikTok format and kind of, I don't know, if you're into V.C. Andrews at all and that uniquely somewhat horrifying (laughs) genre of fiction... Um, if you've read those books, I think you will appreciate V.C. Andrew's life. She's one of my favorite TikTok accounts, other than Books in the Freezer, of course. <laughs> oh, well, thank you for the shout out. <laughs> it's your fault that I'm on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I do know that account, but I didn't read a ton of V.C. Andrew's books. So it's like I don't relate to a lot of them, but I'm like, it's just wild. All of these things are just absolutely (laughs) wild that they just exist out in the world. And they were just taken as mass pop culture. Just these crazy gothic incest stories. And people were like, yeah. Yes. Obviously. 
And I love that, you know, she sees things in life, like in the thrift store or elsewhere. And she's like, these are things that give me V.C. Andrews vibes. And I'm like, ugh, it's just something that, you know, either it is a big part of your pop culture, you know, history, love, uh, et cetera, or it's you wouldn't really like it. So (laughs) (laughs) it's not for you. But I think that's that goes with this episode. So I'm going to put it in here. V.C. Andrews like that works. I love it. Laura, it's always fun to have you on and have us chat. It's always fun to be yeah. here. Just just yes. chat. Like, we could have honestly... Well, we have so many Voxer messages that are just about Gone Girl anyway. <laughs> um, so it was good to get them recorded and <laughs> on an episode. I think we could have... We had so many even before we decided to do this episode. <laughs> we really did. Oh, man. All right. Well, thank you again for coming on. Thank you for having me. All right. <laughs> Books in the Freezer is a bi-weekly podcast. We post episodes every other Tuesday. You can find us on Twitter at Books Freezer Pod, on Instagram at Books in the Freezer, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash books in the freezer. We are also on TikTok at Books in the Freezer, and you can send us an email at booksinthefreezer at gmail.com. If you would like to support the podcast, there are a few ways to do that. One of them is to become a Patreon supporter at patreon.com slash books in the freezer. There's a one, three and a $5 level uh, with all kinds of different perks. So you can go there and check that out. So you can get like early episode releases, be in Voxer group chats, have movie nights, bonus episodes, all kinds of stuff. So you can check that out. And also recently, Patreon started allowing a like year long. So you can do like a one time payment to support the podcast for the whole year. And then you get a discount on that if you decide to do that. So that's been cool. Uh, A cool little fun addition. Uh, So that is patreon.com slash books in the freezer. Another way to support the podcast is by using the Amazon link uh, that's in the show notes. It just takes you to Amazon and you would do your normal Amazon shopping that you would normally do. And then a small percentage of that goes to help the podcast. So something that uh, someone bought recently looks like a memory foam wedge pillow. Looks comfortable. Also a fabric dresser. Uh, Very nice. Very nice. So thank you. Thank you all of you for uh, just doing small things that help out the podcast. And now you may be thinking, is there a way I can show support for the podcast that doesn't involve money? And you know what? Of course there is. You can share about the podcast on social media or in real life. I mean, you can tell your coworkers about it and your friends. Anything like that helps. Also leaving a review on a site like Apple Podcast and now uh, Spotify is recently allowed like ratings on their podcast. So you can go there. And that one's easier because you don't have to write anything. You just leave a star rating. So pretty simple and a big help to podcasts like this that, you know, really rely on word of mouth. So thank you to all of you who have done that. I am Stephanie. You can find me on Twitter at lady underscore Ganya. That's L-A-D-Y underscore G-A-G-N-O-N. And I'm on Instagram at that's what she read. And that's that's with two A's. So see you next time on Books in the Freezer.